previously about uh, the two things that kill Mrs. Smith, hypoxia and hypoperfusion. So we want to delve into the various causes of hypoxia. And then in a later lesson, we'll talk about how to assess for it and how to treat for it. First thing we ought to do is define hypoxia. So we'll define what it is, and we'll talk about two things that it's not. Um, very simple definition, inadequate oxygen delivered to the tissues is hypoxia. Now that's different than hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is a condition where there's low oxygen in the blood. Certainly hypoxemia is a cause of hypoxia, but they're two separate things. And also hypoxia is not the same thing as hypoperfusion, although we assess for them both pretty much at the same time. We're concerned about them both, but they are not the same thing. So what are the causes of hypoxia? Well, there's a number of them, um, and we're going to explore those by talking about the major body systems, the cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurological system, because that's how we approach patients and how we assess patients. So a whole bunch of causes that, of hypoxia that are related to the cardiovascular system. It could be that the lungs are not perfused. We'll dig into this in a little bit uh, more detail here in a minute. It could also just be hypoperfusion systemically from a problem with the pump, the blood's not working right, the container's not working right, or this concept called obstructive shock, which we'll talk about again as we dig, dig into this. Obviously, there's respiratory causes of, of hypoxia. If hypoxia is a lack of oxygen in the tissues, then um, the respiratory system would, would clearly be a key component to that. Maybe there's just not enough oxygen in the, in the air that's being breathed in. Maybe there's an airway obstruction in the upper or lower. Maybe the lung tissue itself is, is damaged. Maybe the chest wall is not working right. Maybe the alveoli and that alveolar capillary membrane where the gas exchange occurs, maybe that's damaged. And don't forget, the neurological system is in, in command of this whole thing and is doing command and control for both respiratory and cardiovascular. So we have to investigate neurological causes of hypoxia, all of them related to the brain not functioning for various reasons, maybe um, alcohol or drugs, or increased pressure in the skull, or low glucose, or a high or a low temperature. Maybe the brain's not perfused. Maybe there's some disease process like seizures or a stroke or something going on. So there's a bunch of things to talk about with neurological system. So again, um, we're going to talk about these in terms of these three major body systems, and we're going to explore deeper uh, one at a time. So the first one we'll take is the cardiovascular system. And perhaps uh, it's a problem with the lungs or it's a problem systemically. So how would the lungs not be perfused? Well, perhaps the right ventricle of the heart is not pumping effectively and blood's not being supplied to the lungs. Maybe there's a problem um, with the amount of blood coming into the heart, which is preload, and so realize that the heart can only pump out what it gets in, and if it's not getting enough blood to come in, then it can't pump enough blood out. So maybe there's a problem with a, an inappropriately reduced preload, and we'll discuss this much further in our course, in our curriculum. Or it could be something called a pulmonary embolus, which is a clot that is formed in the vascular system in the lungs. On the arterial side, a clot that is formed, either formed there, but more commonly is formed elsewhere as a thrombus and then traveled. So a traveling thrombus or a traveling clot is called an embolus. And that embolus has lodged in the pulmonary arteries, causing a pulmonary embolism. This would, produce, would reduce the amount of blood that's flowing to the lungs and would then obviously make uh, circulation to the lungs, perfusion to the lungs compromised which means then that blood is not available for oxygen to exchange with it. So one of the causes of hypoxia could be something that's going on in the lungs in terms of perfusion of the lungs. It could also be that the pump itself is just not functioning well. And we talked about the right ventricle not perfusing the lungs, but it could be um, that the right ventricle is working fine, but the left ventricle is having trouble, or, the, or the, both ventricles, the pump as a whole, is not working effectively. Maybe the rate is too slow. Maybe it, it's simply pumping at a heart rate of in the 30s or 40s, and you know normal heart rates would be in the 70s or 80s, and there's just not enough pumping action, it's just not pumping often enough. 
It also could be that the, that the heart is, is pumping too fast. So if a normal heart rate's 80, but the person's heart rate is now running at 240, at three times the normal rate, the ventricles simply don't have enough time to fill. And so the ventricles are not fully filled before they pump, before they contract, and that reduces your stroke volume, reduces the amount of blood uh, that's being ejected from the heart, which is stroke volume, because the ventricles simply can't fill. Speaking of stroke volume, maybe the, the left ventricle is, is injured in some way, damaged, um, in, a, in a condition that's known as CHF, or congestive heart failure. Uh, perhaps the patient has had high blood pressure for years and years, and that muscle has become larger and larger. The left ventricle's muscles become larger and larger in an attempt to push against that high blood pressure. And as that muscle has swollen, then the chamber inside the ventricle, the space where the blood would fill, has been reduced. And the person has CHF simply because of long-term chronic hypertension or high blood pressure. It could also be that that left ventricle has been damaged from myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. Myocardial infarction mean that the patient's heart muscle has died. And so a situation that's caused a heart attack has then caused that left ventricle to have some residual uh, lack of function after the heart attack. And so now we can have a pump malfunction uh, caused by a weak ventricle um, or an inappropriate heart rate. When we think about the cardiovascular system, we talk about a pump, a volume, and container. So we talked about the pump being a problem. Now we talk about the blood volume. Maybe there's something wrong with the blood. Remember that red blood cells are the mechanism for delivery of oxygen, so red blood cells are the delivery vans, and if there's simply not enough of them, or the red blood cells, um, there's not enough red blood cells because they have uh, died from some sort of disease or are not producing enough in anemia, or there's a loss of total blood volume from bleeding, if there's just simply not enough red blood cells around, to, to transport the oxygen, you can have a, an intact respiratory system bringing in all the oxygen you could ever need, but it can't get pumped around because there's nothing uh, to carry it on. Maybe the ventricles are working fine, the pump's doing fine, but the blood itself is inadequate in, in terms of volume or in terms of red cells. This last concept, <clears throat> and we're talking about carbon monoxide here. Sometimes you'll see CO as cardiac output as well, but in this case we mean carbon monoxide. And the deal there is very simple, that red blood cells um, have space for carrying oxygen or CO, and uh, CO attaches to those red blood cells very readily, and it doesn't let go. So a red blood cell could be occupied by the carbon monoxide, and the red blood cell makes a trip out to the periphery and back about every 20 seconds, so about three times a minute, a red blood cell goes out and back to some tissues in the periphery. And as the delivery truck goes out, trying to take oxygen out there, it's full. It's full of CO. And so you can be hypoxic, have a reduced delivery of oxygen to the tissues because there's no place for the oxygen to ride on the red blood cells. So again, talking about hypoxia causes that are related to the cardiovascular system, we can have pump problems, we can have volume problems, and then we need to talk about container problems. Uh, perhaps the container has simply gotten too large, and so there is a, a lack of pressure because the container has gotten abnormally and inappropriately large. Well, what would cause that? Well, a severe allergic reaction known as anaphylaxis can cause that. A severe systemic infection known as sepsis could cause that. Or this concept of neurogenic shock could cause that. If you have an injury to your spinal cord, and the spinal cord is conducting messages from the brain to the blood vessels to tell the blood vessels to stay constricted somewhat, in the absence of any messages, blood vessels simply take a break. Blood vessels don't uh, wait around to be told to do something. They simply take a break. And so if the spinal cord is not able to deliver the message from the brain, even though the brain is telling the blood vessels to, say, to stay somewhat constricted, telling those muscles to stay contracted to some extent. Um, if that message doesn't get through, the blood vessels simply take a break. 
So an extra large container, either from anaphylaxis, sepsis, or neurogenic shock, could also cause hypoperfusion, and that would be one of the multiple cardiovascular causes. And the last piece on cardiovascular causes is this concept that we're going to talk about called obstructive shock. And in the opening slide on there, I talked about babies and bubbles as a kind of a slang way to remember that. So let's talk about bubbles first. It means we have to introduce this concept called a tension pneumothorax. Well, pneumothorax, we're going to do some medical terms here. If pneumo means air and thorax means chest cavity, then we have air inside the chest cavity outside the lung, which tends to exert pressure on the structures in the mediastinum. Remember, the mediastinum has the heart, um, the great vessels, the aorta, vena cava, and the trachea. And it's that compression of the vena cava by this air bubble that's building up outside the lungs but inside the chest cavity, typically from a, a penetrating trauma that, or a weakness in the lung, something that's caused a hole to be to form in the lung. And as you exhale, some air goes out through your mouth, some air goes out through the hole in the lung and is trapped inside the chest cavity. And so this air bubble, this pneumothorax, starts to build up. At the point where it begins to push on the structures in the mediastinum, we have what's called a tension pneumothorax, and that air bubble will actually get large enough that it will compress the vena cava. It will push on the heart, cause the heart to torque, twist a little bit, and the vena cava is, is, is like a, a fire hose that has no, no, no fluid in it. It's a, it's a collapsed hose, and it's easily twisted and kinked off. And so as this air bubble builds up, pushes on the heart, heart twists a little bit, kinks off the vena cava, which reduces preload. Remember from the last slide, or a slide or two ago, we talked about preload. Preload is the amount of blood coming back to the heart. So if this air bubble is squishing the vena cava and keeping blood from coming back to the heart, we now have a low preload caused from an obstructive shock from this large air bubble. Same thing can happen in, um, with the pregnant uterus. Uh, same thing can happen in the abdomen where the, the patient that's 20 weeks or 24 weeks along, um, at least halfway, closer to two-thirds of the way um, through gestation, and that large, heavy fetus, a large, heavy baby, will be pressing posteriorly on the vena cava and reduce the preload from that. So babies and bubbles, both of them causing the vena cava to be compressed, which reduces preload, and remember, the heart can only pump out what, it, what is brought back to it. So one possible cardiovascular cause of hypoxia would be uh, hypoperfusion from the obstructive shock. So at this point, your head's probably spinning and you're saying, there's certainly a ton of things that it could be a cardiovascular cause. It could be a pump problem. It could be a blood volume problem. It could be a container problem. It could be this obstructive shock, which is kind of a container problem, and there's a problem um, with the return flow. It could be a lot of those things. But there's many, many causes also for us to still talk about. Respiratory. One very simple one would be, you know, what, what would be a cause of low oxygen delivery to the tissues? Well, low incoming oxygen to the lungs. If, if the lungs are intact, the cardiovascular system's intact, the neurosystem's intact, everything's fine, but you're simply breathing in air that's low in oxygen, then there's going to be a low amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues, and that would cause hypoxia. Where do you find that? You find that at altitude. You can also find it in confined space areas that are not appropriately ventilated. So um, just keep that in mind. Very uncommon, but as long as we're doing kind of a comprehensive look at what the cause of hypoxia are, we need to talk about that. Other respiratory system causes of hypoxia, you could have an upper airway obstruction, most commonly the tongue. Could also be a foreign body, um, and especially small kids will, will explore things in their mouth and they choke on things. So if you can't get any air in, obviously you can't uh, transport oxygen to the tissues and so we have hypoxia. Another very common cause of upper airway obstruction are uh, things that we can suction out, uh, blood, emesis, uh, 
variety of other things are based on the mechanism of injury. So it could be an upper airway obstruction. We want to always manage those uh, aggressively and early in our, in our care. Could be a lower airway obstruction. I mentioned in a previous lesson that there's basically three things that cause bronchioles to obstruct. One is mucus builds up. Another is some inflammation and swelling from an allergic process that's going on. And then the muscular walls in the bronchioles themselves can constrict down. So bronchial obstruction could be a cause of hypoxia. Could have an upper airway obstruction or a lower airway obstruction. Maybe the lung itself is not working right. Maybe the lung itself is collapsed from a pneumothorax, which we talked about previously, as well as the tension, or it could be a bruised lung. Where blood has collected in the lung tissue and is preventing um, the oxygen from mixing with the bloodstream. So you have a bruised lung or a pulmonary contusion. And these things would be traumatic causes of hypoxia. More traumatic causes of hypoxia could be the chest walls not intact. Maybe there's a hole in the chest from a gunshot or a knife or some other penetrating trauma, and the whole system's not working well because it's the chest is supposed to be a sealed up system. So we have an untreated sucking chest wound um, that could cause hypoxia as one of the respiratory system problems. Could be a flail chest, another term we're introducing here, and that is simply a series of rib fractures. So it needs to be two or more consecutive ribs broken in two or more places. It can't be you know, the third rib and the tenth rib, that doesn't count. Those rib fractures make it hard to breathe, make it painful to breathe, and so a person may not be breathing deeply enough, and that would cause hypoxia. But this flail chest, again, very uncommon, but if you have your third, fourth, and fifth ribs all broken in two places, uh, adjacent to each other, the segment in between the break is not going to be functioning well. And as you inhale and your chest should be going out, that flail segment will suck in. And as you exhale, your chest should be relaxing and reducing in its size, and that flail will expand out or flail out. So it could be an unstable chest wall segment. could also be something um, kind of bizarre, kind of... Um, uncommon, a rescue situation, trench collapse comes to mind, or some other sort of uh, heavy structural collapse where there's so much weight on the person's chest that they're not able to breathe. Could also be inappropriate restraint. We talk about this with uh, a phrase called positional asphyxia that we'll address later in the curriculum, of course. But positional asphyxia is when a, a person is restrained face down. Um, the typical cases are a fairly large individual, has a fairly decent body size, and a large body mass, and they are restrained face down, um, and they are simply um, impaired, they have impaired chest wall movement, which causes them not to exchange enough air, which can lead to hypoxia. Then a number of other things that can cause you chest wall pain that are medical causes. If you remember about the pleura, we talked about uh, the pleural lining in a previous lesson. That can become inflamed, so a condition called pleurisy. It's very painful. Um, or just chest wall pain, um, perhaps from, from muscular strain. So anything that's going to keep that chest wall from moving like it should um, can produce a respiratory cause, respiratory system cause for hypoxia. Another thing in the uh, respiratory system, it could be that the alveoli are just not working right. It could be at the al that very important alveolar capillary membrane, the very thin membrane that we talked about previously. Um, it could be that that's not working right. Well, why would that not work right? Um, potentially it's damaged. Um, uh, lung disease patients, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, emphysema patients, patients that have smoked for a long time, have actually damaged that alveolus. It could also be that there's fluid that's built up in there. Um, and if you think about the circulatory system, if that left ventricle is not able to pump as effectively as it should, then blood backs up into the left atrium. So you have left ventricle not working, which backs up into left atrium, which then backs up into the pulmonary system, which gives you a, a backup of blood, a lot of swelling, at that very important membrane between the alveolus and the capillaries. And if that, al if that membrane is 
is thicker than it should normally be because of swelling, and you don't have an appropriate diffusion of gas back and forth across there. So it could be that the heart's pumping just fine, the vascular system's intact, there's sufficient air being brought in, the chest wall is, is fine, um, but then you've got this uh, situation with, sorry, then you've got this situation with um, the uh, pulmonary edema where the blood is backing up in, into the, the pulmonary system, the pulmonary vascular system, because that left ventricle is not pumping right. The other one, um, it could be just pneumonia. It could be an infection. So you've got pus that's built up in the alveoli. So we talked about cardiovascular problems, something going wrong with the pump, uh, where the pump is weak or it's going too fast or too slow, or it's not getting enough blood back to it, so the preload is reduced and it, the heart doesn't have enough blood to pump out. It could be that the blood volume is low. Um, it could be that the blood itself doesn't have enough red cells. Or it could be a container problem where you have a leak or you have an inappropriately large container or you have the container being squished in an obstructive shock. On the respiratory side, um, it could be just inadequate air coming in. Um, it could be that there's a airway obstruction, either an upper or lower. And it could be that there's a damaged, um, the alveolar capillary membrane is damaged for some reason. So there's a ton of causes, very common causes, that are both related uh, to two of those major body systems, which means we've got one more to talk about. And you can see there's a whole pyramid of things that can go wrong here. So I'm going to go through those um, one at a time here um, briefly. Because your neurosystem is command and control, and it directs the function of the respiratory system to bring air in and get air out, and it directs the function of the cardiovascular system to circulate blood with oxygen in it around, the neurosystem um, is the command and control of those other two. And any time that the brain function is depressed, for whatever reason, then you're at risk for hypoxia. Perhaps heavy alcohol use, maybe street drugs, recreational drugs, heroin comes to mind as one um, street drug that causes the brain function to be depressed, which causes the brain to tell the respiratory system to breathe less often, so a slower respiratory rate. Um, it could be medications that are given um, for, for treatment, and morphine comes to mind there. Morphine and heroin are, are cousins. It could also be chemicals. The carbon monoxide we talked about earlier doesn't just take up space on red blood cells. That should be for oxygen. It also directly depresses brain function. Could be some other kind of bizarre chemical that has a uh, hazardous material that has effect on the brain or certainly a, a terrorist sort of weapon. Brain function can also be depressed by swelling, swelling inside the skull, or um, an elevation in what's called ICP, intracranial pressure. And that can happen from one type of stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleed in your brain. And the deal is in your skull, there's only supposed to be three things. There's supposed to be brain tissue, there's supposed to be blood inside the blood vessels, and there's supposed to be a little bit of cerebrospinal fluid floating around. There should not be blood outside the vessels. There should not be tumors. There should not be foreign objects in there. And so um, direct injury to the brain, either from a medical cause, from a bleed, or from a traumatic cause, or from a tumor, any of those things can cause brain function to be depressed, which will typically cause a slower respiratory rate, which will add to problems with hypoxia. Real simple concept here, your brain needs lots of glucose and it needs it all the time. So lack of sufficient glucose to the brain means brain cells can't make energy, which means they don't function well, which means they don't control the cardiovascular and respiratory system well, and that can lead to hypoxia. Same thing with temperature, whether it's uh, a heat stroke or a hypothermia, whether the brain is too hot or too cold, um, the brain doesn't function well, so it doesn't do its controlling well. Or the thermostat for your body is the hypothalamus located in your brain. And so um, environmental causes or fever causes, um, increased temperature or decreased temperature can cause that entire body temperature regulation mechanism to not work well.
Brain function could also be depressed very simply by hypoperfusion. It's just not getting enough blood flow. The blood needs lots of oxygen. I'm sorry, the brain needs lots of oxygen and needs lots of glucose. And it gets those from the bloodstream. So the blood supply is very important to the brain. Neurologic causes also that could, could cause the brain not to function well, strokes in certain part of the brain, or a seizure, which is simply um, brain function gone wild. It's just electrical chaos going on in the brain. So the brain's not controlling anything very well because it's not working quite right. And then severe infection can do the same thing, a sepsis or a severe systemic infection from a pneumonia, urinary tract infection, or whatever uh, the infectious agent is has caused the brain to not be functioning well. So now we've got a ton of, of cardiovascular causes, a ton of respiratory causes, um, quite a few neurologic causes. And what you have here is a situation building up where hypoxia can happen for a number of reasons, where we can have an adequate oxygen delivered to the tissues. Usually it's best that we um, look through those major body systems and, and try to assess their function and deal with them. It could be it's just low O2 in the blood, but don't be confused by similar sounding terms. Hypoxemia, as we said, is, is low O2 in the blood. It's, got, it's not low O2 in the tissues. And then hypoperfusion is certainly a culprit in hypoxia, but you can have hypoperfusion, or so you can have hypoxia without hypoperfusion, as we talked about, with a neuro problem or a respiratory problem. So that is a fairly high-speed review of a ton of causes of hypoxia. And then the next thing we're going to talk about in, in a follow-up lesson will be how to assess for hypoxia and how to manage hypoxia. Thanks for listening.